Hello, everybody, and good evening. I am Dr. Harold Bennett, and I am the dean of our phenomenal graduate school, the Charles Harrison Mason Theological Seminary at the Interdenominational Theological Center in Atlanta, Georgia. And I welcome you to our 52nd Founders Week celebrations. Thank you for joining us. I am so glad that you will be a part of the activities this week. You know, I, I thank the Lord for our presiding bishop, Bishop J. Drew Sheard. I thank the Lord for our general board. I thank the Lord for the chairman of the Charles Harrison Mason Theological Seminary, Bishop David Hall, who is a general board member. I thank the Lord for our general supervisor, Mother McCool Lewis. I tell you, the people of God have really looked after our seminary and prayed for us. And, and I'm just glad that you are a part of what we're going to do this week. The Charles Harrison Mason Theological Seminary is a part of the ITC. Now, the ITC opened in 1958. So the ITC has been doing business for a long time, training men and women for ministry in the Church of God in Christ. And the Charles Harrison Mason Theological Seminary is a part of this great work. This week, oh, we got a lot planned for you. We're going to talk about enhancing the, the teaching and learning ministry in our local churches. I am really trusting the Lord, and I believe it's going to happen, that what we're talking about this week will be a blessing to you and your ministry. So tell everybody about what we're doing this week as we celebrate 52 years of educating, equipping, and training men and women for ministry in the Church of God in Christ and throughout the world. God bless you. My name is Elder Keith Brown, and I'm, I was the class of 2019. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, God, we want to thank you now, God, for all your goodness, your glory, and your mercy, Lord. We ask you, God, that you touch on our leadership, God, our presiding bishop, Lord, Bishop Sheard, the Board of Bishops, God, C.H. Mason Seminary, God. We ask you, God, that you bless our Dean, God, Dean Bennett, Dean Harold Bennett, Lord. We ask you, God, that you continue to bless him, God. Bless his body, God, and keep him safe, Lord. God, we ask you, God, that you touch on the C.H. Mason Seminary's 52-year Founders Week, God. We ask you, God, that you highlight, Lord, uh, those that are coming into seminary education, God, theological education, Lord. We ask you, God, that all the gifts, God, that we have, God, all the talent, God, and all of the things, God, that we're doing, God, for Founders Week, God. We ask you that you receive it, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, God. We ask you, God, that you just continue, God, to bless us, God, keep us going, God, for your first, Lord. You are our Lord, God, and we love you, Lord. And so for that, Lord, we just want to say hallelujah, God. Thank you, Jesus, and amen. Hi, I'm Catherine Arnett Porter, and I am part of the graduating class of 1991 at the ITC, C.H. Mason Seminary. I will read in your hearing this evening, 2 Timothy 2 and 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman needing not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. May this word be a blessing and empower you to be all that God has purposed you to be. God bless. Hello, this is Bishop David Allen Hall, general board member and president of the C.H. Mason Theological Seminary Board of Trustees. Welcome to the C.H. Mason Theological Seminary Founders Week for 2022. I greet you in the name of Jesus and for the Board of Trustees, for Dr. Harold Bennett, President and Dean of the Seminary, all the staff and faculty of the school. We thank God for your presence here, and we are so glad for, of course, this opportunity to present the seminary, the world's only black accredited Pentecostal seminary, and this seminary serves the church of God in Christ. Serves the church worldwide, more than 300 graduates now serving as bishops in our church, supervisors, 
those who serve on national boards, elected officials, who serve in the capacity of institutional ministries, chaplains in our armed forces, and in other institutions, business, teaching college, and graduate school. We have our graduates as pastors and also as ministry professionals doing numerous things wherever it needs to be done. We thank you for coming to visit with us and allow me to say for the school, for the board of trustees, and all of you, that this is your seminary, and this presentation celebrates what God has done for us, not only as a church, but as an academic institution serving humanity as well. Let me say it in the words of Bishop J.O. Patterson, Sr., to have your burning while you have your learning. We do not forget who we are. We have not forgotten about the burning power of the Holy Ghost in our lives. And so enjoy this presentation. We greet you and believe that this will be something that you will find quite interesting and very satisfying. God bless you. Thank you. Hello, friends. I'm Bishop Chadwick F. Carlton, Commissioner of Education, Church of God in Christ. You know, religious and theological education is critical to the spiritual, mental, and physical maturation of the believer and cleric who discerns personal callings to reveal the mysteries of God through authoritative sources, both primary and secondary. Charles Harrison Mason Seminary, one of our few instructional venues in graduate school, pauses now on the 52nd Founders Week of the Charles Harrison Mason Seminary to commemorate the indelible imprint of our beloved founder left on Christian education in the corpus of theological and religious reflection, but also promotes the importance of religious education in the local assembly. Throughout history, educational modules reminiscent to Sunday school, YPWW, and Bible study have all aided to increase the aptitude of the Christian believer and undergirded measurable transformation of the human heart. Those traditional hallmarks live onward today to belie some of the evils of postmodernity that promote religious pluralism, syncretism, and other unorthodox forms of religious expression that obscure the revelation of God through Jesus Christ. So it is important that we do not reduce the number of educational opportunities in our local assemblies, but enhance the ones we have and pray for fresh vision to add necessary and relevant educational components that take into account a society that is becoming increasingly cosmopolitan and liberal in scope. This week, we celebrate our Pentecostal roots that are often expressed through charisms of the Holy Spirit and the intentionality of our beloved founder, Bishop Charles Harrison Mason, who searched the scriptures and other credible sources voraciously to ground his religious experience. And our quest should be no less than the precedent established by Bishop Mason to study advently and find ways to incorporate new forms of religious education that are adaptable to those in the local church. The theme of Founders Week this year is enhancing the teaching ministry of the local church. There will be sessions from an array of presenters that will no doubt elicit thought-provoking themes from the Bible and supplemental sources you may choose to take back to your local assemblies and implement. While listening to the presenters, please provide your sentiments and or questions in the chat room. Your robust engagement will enhance the online experience for all participants. Charles Harrison Mason Seminary Founders Week, a commemoration of the past and an endearment to a promising future that juxtaposes relevant education and experience, the embodiment of Pentecostal expression. You don't want to miss this week. Happy Founders Week. Hello and welcome to the C.H. Mason Theological Seminary Founders Week. I am Superintendent Brandon Pierce and I'm so excited to have you join with us as we have this roundtable, if you will, concerning theological education in our church. Uh, I am joined today uh, by co-host, uh, the Reverend Crystal Miller Davis, uh, excuse me, Assistant Supervisor Crystal Miller Davis. I want to make sure we get it right in this church. <laughs> Man. Yeah. Man, don't get me put out. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and uh, along with um, uh, Supervisor Davis, we also are joined by Bishop Elijah Hankerson, Bishop Linwood Dillard, Superintendent Micaiah Young, uh, Chair Lady Vandalyn Kennedy, 
Uh, he's an evangelist missionary. I want to make sure I say these titles right. Crystal Bracy and uh, a mother uh, evangelist, uh, Wright Harris. And so we are once again excited and glad to have you all uh, joining with us for Founders Week. Amen. So today's conversation, uh, as of course we are being hosted by the C.H. Mason Theological Seminary, is about uh, theological education in the church. And so I don't know, let's start off uh, today's panel with a simple question. Why is theological education important? Well, I'll take a shot at it, Brother Pierce. Um, thank you so much for allowing us to uh, be here, and God bless this distinguished panel, and thank God for uh, Dr. Bennett allowing us to come together. Um, why theology and theological education is important, I think you have to look at the definition of the word theology, um, which literally is defined as the study of God. And I would think that that would be the most important um, aspect of our study life to study <clears throat> about him so that we can reflect the more of him in our character. And um, I know that many people may feel like um, a seminary education is not important. Um, however, even for those that have not attended uh, seminary, we reap the benefits of those that have when we study from commentaries, when we study from our Sunday school material. Um, that is the work of uh, scholars that have labored. And so I think that um, theology and theological education is really the bedrock um, of standing in our faith and defending our faith and living our faith. So that's how I would respond to that. And if I could uh, just piggyback Bishop Hankerson and God bless everyone in such an honor to uh, share and be a part of this uh, discussion on today. And we certainly celebrate uh, C.H. Mason Theological Seminary. Uh, the question that you pose, I think is a very critical one because uh, there may be some stigma around theological education, especially in uh, the holiness Pentecostal churches uh, because we rely upon and we do not deny the spontaneity and inspiration of the Holy Spirit who himself is a teacher according to what Jesus Christ said. Uh, but Bishop Hankerson mentioned that word theology. And when you think about theological or theology, uh, doing theology, education, biblical studies, uh, there's one definition that I'm sure uh, my brothers and sisters are familiar with, and that is faith seeking understanding, understanding and knowing God. And from a historical perspective, uh, when the New Testament church was established in the first, second, and third centuries, the church was under great fire, and there was a lot of uh, contention within the ranks of the Jewish community, as well as the Roman government was oppressive toward the church to try to bring destruction to the Christian faith. And so it became necessary for the early church fathers to uh, encourage, number one, but also given an apology, defense, or defending the faith. So these men had to be learned men, they had to be communicators, they had to be writers, having this understanding of God to give some doctrinal defense and understanding of why we do what we do. Bringing it up to this point, we are in a world and society where the enemy is still after the Christian faith to destroy it, to bring confusion and bring heresy, and it's incumbent upon men and women whose uh, hand, uh, God's hand is upon to prepare themselves and be trained and learned uh, and educated in the things of God from a formal perspective. And so I think that it is critically important, especially with all that we're grappling with in this 21st century and the enemy has turned up his heat, that we avail ourselves to understand God. And it's an ongoing process. They used to sing when I was growing up, every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. And so as we learn and we grow uh, through these formal settings, uh, we'll be able to give an apology and a defense of our faith. One, 
one of the, wow, these are phenomenal. This is getting me going. Uh, one of the things you talked about, and thank you again for having me. I honor Dr. Bennett, and I'm thankful for this seminary and for all of these uh, phenomenal ministry gifts. Uh, one of the things that uh, Bishop Dillard, you uh, spoke about the stigma of us having the spirit and us focusing on the spirit. In that same way, there is a stigma with ministry cohorts and other denominations and other people that all we do is rely on the spirit and that we in fact are not thinkers and that we are not intelligent and that we just have the spirit. So in that same way that that same stigma of going to seminary within our context uh, is very prevalent, it's also very prevalent outside of our context, which sometimes keeps us from connecting and contributing in spaces that we certainly are able to contribute uh, in, but are not respected uh, in because of uh, what is perceived as ignorance. And so I think that is important. Uh, I was blessed to study with uh, uh, James Cone, Dr. James Cone. And one of the things that he says is the study of theology is worshiping God with your mind. Mm -hmm. That's how he brought us into systematic theology. And so it is using our minds. And so I think that's why uh, theology is, is important. And I'll piggyback off of what everyone has said. First and foremost, God bless you, um, Dean Bennett. Thank you so much for the invitation. Um, I'm battling a little bit of a cold, so please excuse me there. But honor to everyone um, who's on the panel today, all of our esteemed panelists, um, and to the C.H. Mason Seminary. Um, so why seminary? So first and foremost, um, training. Um, training is essential uh, for the pastorate or for congregational leadership. So it is important to build a skill set, such as if you wanted to become a doctor or become an attorney. Um, it behooves us to, um, to perfect our craft, and seminary allows us to do that for those uh, that are leaders in ministry. Um, the other thing is um, seminary is, is education. It's furthering your education. Um, the Master's of Divinity degree specifically is a professional degree, um, and it is a very fluid degree. So it's not just um, an advanced Bible study or a rigorous Sunday school, but this is an actual uh, degree program. But seminary is also um, a space for those who are called to further discern your calling. Um, it's a space for you to go deeper in your faith. Um, for myself, it was a place of wrestling and learning learning and growing um, and a space of stretching where you can do um, internal reflection and really have your theology challenged, yet you can grow in your personal faith. I think in another thing, um, that is a benefit of, of going to seminary is it really helps you to build a fellowship of trained, um, supportive religious friends. Um, even now, uh, my cohort, we turn to each other, fellow pastors for academic, spiritual, moral support, for guidance, for enhancing those skills, uh, preaching sermons and things like that, piggybacking off of each other, and then ideas for discipleship. Most of my classmates are all pastors in their own respective denominations. And, you know, we have a weekly call. Hey, what are you preaching this week? And what tools are you using? What things are you doing in your church or in your congregation that's working for you? And not always do you have to reinvent the wheel, but sometimes you and other trained persons are able to dialogue and get new, fresh ideas uh, for your uh, uh, respective ministries. I'd like to, at this point, chime in. And I do think uh, Dr. Bennett, for including me on this panel with some great, great um, um, uh, fellow Christians, I guess is what I'll say. Um, I am um, a student at ITC in the uh, D-Men program. And in, in deciding to go to seminary, I always had a, a longing for more. Whatever I heard over the pulpit, I kind of questioned, okay, so what was going on at that time? And, you know, Bible study, it was always questionable. There was always something that was lacking an answer. And, you know, I thought, well, you know, I need to find out. And I've always been a person of education. Just, just you know, knowledge is just something that is just wonderful and awesome. And to get to know as Dr. Diller said, the, the nature of, you know, the, my, my God, to actually know his character 
to, to build a foundation that I can build on as I go through ministry. So, you know, in order to know what I'm talking about, I need to know what I'm talking about. And that is one of the things that drew me to um, seminary was to get to better know me and where I stand within the ministry, where God stands in my life, the historical portion of it so I can put it into perspective so that as I articulate to you know, people, what is um, God's word, then, you know, I, I, I have a better understanding and a better foundation. Got to have that foundation. If the foundation isn't strong, where are you going? With it? You know, you, you've got to have that, that foundation. And that's what I'm finding in, in seminary. Wow. Thank you all so much for those powerful and thought provoking responses to the question of why seminary uh, I heard Chair Lady Kennedy speak of uh, our beloved uh, Dr. Cohn, and, and many of you have kind of shared for you your experiences for Evangelist Wright Harris, who is there at our beloved C.H. Mason Seminary. My goodness, what perspective you've given us. I want to lead into the next question and just twist it just a little bit uh, from what you all have shared with us, each of you from our bishops. Uh, it sounds as though everybody in this room hasn't gone to C.H. Mason Seminary uh, as your choice of seminary. And so our, our second question really is, what are some of the factors that should go into a decision about which seminary to attend? And then let's make it personal today. What made you choose the seminary that you attended? I can start, um, Reverend Davis, uh, with answering that. So. Um, there's actually a number of factors um, that go into your decision about which seminary to attend. There are many of them um, across this country. Number one, it, it's a calling. Going to seminary, first and foremost, is a calling uh, more so than anything. But dealing with some, pr some practical things for those who are consider considering going to seminary, um, members of the faculty that you want to study with, um, you already spoke to the fact that Chair Lady uh, Kennedy mentioned that she studied with um, James Cone. Um, I attended Duke Divinity School um, and where I graduated with a Master of Divinity. When I applied to Duke Divinity, I was interested in studying with people like uh, Dr. Dr. William Claire Turner Jr. and um, Dr. Jerusha Neal, Dr. Ebony Marshall Terman, who's now at Yale Divinity School. But if there is a certain member of the faculty, you have looked at their body of work and you want to study with them, a lot of times um, that will um, enhance a person's decision to apply to a particular um, seminary. Um, another thing that you may not we may not discuss a lot, accreditation. That really needs to factor into your decision about which seminary to attend. Is this seminary that you're going to an accredited seminary? Um, your degree is more meaningful if your seminary is accredited. There's a lot of them that are out there that are not accredited by ATS. So I think it's important um, that you keep that into consideration. Also types of programs, um, residential programs, hybrid programs, where are you in your life? I was able to pack up and move from California to North Carolina to do a residential program, but people who um, are married or who have children or who are already pastoring may not be able to do those type of things. Um, can you leave your job? Um, so those type of things, the length of the program, the emphasis of the program, I think I spoke to earlier um, that I have a Master of Divinity, but there are a number of different degree programs at each respective seminary. So again, what you want to accomplish uh, needs to fit which program that you enroll, your, um, enroll yourself in. Um, and then just a couple more things, conservative or liberal in stance, that's something to, or moderate. The seminary that I went to was a little bit more moderate um, on the spectrum, but um, um, I will say that that's something that you should definitely uh, keep into consideration. And then finances, that's another big thing. Um, that factored into my decision to go to Duke Divinity School. I actually negotiated between Duke Divinity and Candler, um, probably for a couple of months, going back and forth, trying to see who was going to offer me the most financial aid so that I would have the least amount of debt um, upon my graduation. And then to your last question, Reverend Davis, uh, one of the main reasons why I chose to go to Duke Divinity 
Divinity School, um, it's a little bit different than a seminary. I wanted to go to a larger university. So I went to UC Berkeley for undergrad and Duke Divinity gave me a little bit of the same experience. This allowed me to, um, I have an interest in going to law school. I was able to take classes at the law school. You can take classes at the medical school. Duke offers dual degree programs that other seminaries may not offer. So that factored into my decision and along the lines of what you want to do professionally may also factor into your decision about seminary as well. I'd say also, uh, first of all, um, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Bennett, for this opportunity. And it's a pleasure to be with all of my um, uh, brothers and uh, sisters here today. And uh, I am the only one uh, that doesn't have on a tie, but I'm also the only uh, uh, panelist that is not a member of the uh, celebrated bishopric. And so uh, I think that due to my being in Hawaii, this is about the best that I'm able to do at this time. Please accept me <laughs> today. Um, but uh, anyway, um, I think that I agree with everything that uh, my sister Crystal has said. Um, there's so many factors that go into your decision. Um, one, uh, at the time that I attended seminary, um, it was location, um, one of the main factors. They did not have, at that time, a lot of distant learning programs where you could go online and what have you um, to schools that uh, were in places that you did not live. Um, however, but I um, further uh, gave um, much thought to what context I would want to work in, how I would want to use my seminary training. I wanted to be prepared uh, to work in any context. I wanted to understand uh, a diverse um, uh, 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 diverse uh, theological perspectives um, and to be able to, um, if need be, go in and out of different religious settings. However, I wanted to be equipped uh, to work in the Black context to um, uh, exercise the liberation theology. I wanted to uh, be able to get more tools to serve the community and to minister to the people who were oppressed and who represented um, uh, demographics that I had come from. And uh, such as we talked in the last question about why going to seminary, um, it's not about um, assimilating, um, but for me, it was about definition. Where will I go and be able to find a greater definition of uh, who I am and how to explain to the people that I will serve who they are. And so I found that with such uh, professors that I studied with who had done extensive work in uh, liberation and um, teaching us how to um, find ourselves in God. And that was so important um, because um, for so long, um, I had not seen um, where uh, my people uh, fit into uh, the biblical context and to the narrative, but I was able to um, so vividly see how we fit and find ourselves and our expression there. And um, that's why I chose um, to attend uh, ITC, which is where I went. Um, there were a number of places that I could have and have been exposed to. My mother graduated uh, in the 70s from uh, Colgate um, there in Rochester. And um, so I had uh, experience of um, uh, different uh, seminary uh, perspectives, but I wanted to be prepared to particularly um, minister in the context of our Black theology and to um, lift up the people that I would serve. I'd like to um, emulate exactly what Brother Young is saying as far as choosing uh, ITC. I didn't have a, a, a wide variety of um, seminaries that I was looking at. I knew that I wanted to have that uh, Black cultural experience um, in dealing with my community, I needed to understand them. I needed to know the psychology of, you know, why we do or have done what we've been doing. 
you know, why are we walking this journey the way that we've been walking it? And how, as he was talking, we can liberate ourselves. You know, um, right now we're studying decolonization. You know, we, we, we have this colonized mind that just needs to be liberated. And we are the ones as leaders in the church are the ones to help, um, you know, our, our community in this journey. So the educational part in, in, in choosing, I wanted, I wanted my historical background. That's why I chose I, ITC. I wanted to know what impact slavery had on what, you know, we're, we're teaching across the pulpit today. Why are we saying these things the way that we're saying? You know, we're, we're, we're hyping up the people, but where, where is the social you know, uh, um, implications or, 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 or our, our work to help all the social ills that are going on in our, com our community, you know, our community. So that's one of the reasons why, you know, I, I wanted to go to a historical black college to, to get that experience. My undergrad, my grad degree was from university. So I got that. You know, but I wanted this in particular for my ministry, my journey, you know, as far as dealing with my community. If I can uh, just uh, jump in as well and respond, I may have uh, very similar factors that um, were relevant to our decision to attend Pentecostal Theological Seminary. And I, I believe for all of us, though, uh, that giving prayerful consideration and understand the call of God that we have individual, as we heard uh, Dr. Bracey and Brother Micaiah and the evangelist uh, Harris mentioned, all of those are different contexts. Uh, for me as a pastor and a, a jurisdictional bishop, uh, I began to uh, feel this, I guess you would say this pull because uh, I think my sister Evangelist Kennedy mentioned, sometimes my Pentecostal theology is not as respected. Uh, and uh, there, there is very little in comparison to other faiths and beliefs, very little materials and uh, in-depth uh, theological uh, apology for our holiness Pentecostal faith. So I wanted to expand upon what I understood and understand and also uh, have that meaningful credential to be able to go into spaces and places as well to, in a sense, give a reason for our hope and the defense of our faith, but also to adequately uh, minister and lead and share and defend again our faith within the context of our church. Uh, we are a Bible-believing church. I believe that our doctrine is, is, is firm and it is right and righteous. However, we must be uh, able to defend that in a way that uh, our parishioners, when they go back into their society and communities and context, that they uh, are well equipped. And so that was one of the main reasons that I chose that particular uh, school because it was aligned with the theological soundness of what we have. Although there is a, a uh, I guess you can say an assessment and touch on the various other religious and uh, theological positions. However, it is all seated in, in our uh, faith. Uh, but then also, I think Dr. Crystal uh, Bracey mentioned accreditation, the respect, respectability of the seminaries was important uh, for me. And uh, Pentecost Theological Seminary is one of those um, groups or institutions that is uh, well respected in a number of circles. Uh, and I completed my MDiv uh, there. However, I'm uh, now pursuing the doctorate of ministry. And, uh, and that's gonna be in a HBCU context because now that I have that part that I was looking for at the MDiv level, uh, I've checked that box and now we're moving on uh, just as Evangelist Harris said, I think it's important that we open and broaden our minds and perspectives of how we convey what we convey understanding the reason and historical context of why we're doing that and how is that relevant to our now? I'd like to be uh, very transparent. Um, I'm hoping that uh, the people that watch this um, are not necessarily those that are 
you know, at the place that we are now and are ready to apply, but those that maybe have been thinking, I like to be transparent in saying that I began my seminary journey for the wrong reasons um, or what I felt were the wrong reasons, but I was, uh, the Lord was in it all the way. Um, so, well, I wouldn't say all the wrong reasons, but I definitely uh, wanted scholarly credibility for what I felt like what was my life's work. Um, we don't, you don't need that to do ministry, but I wanted that as uh, Reverend Bracey was talking about uh, doctors being trained and lawyers being trained. Uh, I had come from uh, several degrees, Ivy League context, and I felt like I did not want to be one of these people out here just preaching and hollering. Um, and so I wanted to get uh, a degree. Uh, and so there's nothing wrong with that. But that was really the basis for it. But I also wanted to be a better preacher. Um, and even though what you do in seminary will eventually help you with context and understanding, and you're not going to be a better preacher just by going to seminary. Like there are some seminaries where my seminary, the preaching classes were not good. Um, and there was only one offered. So there was no focus on preaching. So if you are going to seminary, this why that we talked about is so important. Uh, get with the people that are on this panel and find out what have you been doing since you've been in seminary? Because if you're going, I was so disappointed because I thought I was going to get preaching classes out of this world. And probably in the Black context, they're more heavy in that because of our tradition, but I did not receive that. Um, so know your why. Get with some of these people as you're watching, DM them and find out what their journey has been. Um, and so uh, I, that's why I went to seminary. So wh when I got there, my mind was blown. So, OK, let me go to what kind of seminary I chose. So like I said, I had an Ivy League uh, uh, background, several degrees in that. And I decided I wanted a rigorous education. Like I didn't want to go somewhere where I was just easing through. And so I was choosing based on those things. I'm just being transparent because there's someone here that is listening that is going to say, okay, I wanted to go, I want to go to a uh, union at Columbia. I want to go to Princeton. I want to go here, there, but that's not a reason to choose the seminary. Um, the other thing is Reverend uh, Crystal talked about liberal versus uh, a conservative. So I knew that I did not want to go to a conservative seminary because I was raised in a conservative environment and I felt like I knew what our doctrine was. But what I did not know was that I did not want to go all the way to the liberal side either. I ended up going to Union Theological Seminary and <laughs> it was something else. I'm talking about a place that does not even believe in the divinity of Jesus Christ. So it is all scholarly, okay? So when she talked about, there's someone that's listening now that does not understand the, the, the language of conservative or liberal, or, it, it, it's, you don't have to necessarily go somewhere. And I apply to, to a lot of them from liberal to uh, conservative, but you don't have to necessarily go somewhere that teaches exactly what you believe, but don't go somewhere that is all the way to the left, to where there is absolutely no context. You can't even apply, you can't even, and it was good in a way because I learned a lot. And I also now have the tools. I didn't even know that a lot of these progressive theologies were out there. But now I have the tools to answer this generation that is coming along that has what we've le we're learning in seminary. They have this from Google and are able to argue many of the doctrinal beliefs that we have. And I didn't even know they existed, y'all. I had no clue. So it was a help in that. Um, and I was able to come along in my journey. But uh, that's why I chose uh, why I chose. And I would have probably chosen a little different. I applied to Princeton and I would have probably gone there because they're a little uh, more middle of the road. Um, but and I'm not saying I know this is going off through, throughout the airways. I'm not saying, you know, don't go to Union, but I'm saying talk to me. <laughs> God bless you, Reverend Davis, and thank you so much 
for that um, question and enjoyed uh, Evangelist Kennedy and everyone that has shared. It's such a blessing to be with such a distinguished panel. Uh, one of the things that I've heard uh, that has gone through the answers that we're giving is the word uh, calling. I will state this, that it was my dream as a child uh, to go to C.H. Mason Seminary. And many of you may remember uh, back when we were all uh, young children, the dream was to go to uh, All Saints University. We were getting ready for ASU. That was going to be in Memphis. And I had a dream of going to ASU there at Saints Center, uh, which was the dream of the administration of the late Bishop J.O. Patterson Sr., and then going on to uh, C.H. Mason Seminary. And so I hold the seminary in the highest regard, um, but definitely uh, it's a calling. And I thank God for listening to the voice of God. I ended up in Springfield, Missouri, and went to an institution of the uh, Assemblies of God. And of course, those that are watching know that the Assemblies of God uh, emanated from the Church of God in Christ um, in the year 1914. And so I went to Evangel University um, for undergrad and then the Assemblies of God Theological Seminary uh, for graduate education. Tremendous institution. And uh, of course, as Evangelist uh, Kennedy has mentioned, sometimes it's good to be in different contexts and settings where you know how to answer uh, that particular mentality because it was during um, those times and years that some of the ultra uh, conservative movement that you see now, which has really gone to the extreme, uh, you could see some of that beginning to develop. And so it's important to understand uh, different mentalities and thoughts so that you can know how to answer uh, to those. And so I thank God for uh, taking heed to the call, of course, um, moving from the state of Washington uh, to the state of Missouri 31 years ago. Um, eventually, I ended up getting married, uh, pastoring a church, and of course, the rest is history. God is truly uh, blessed, but we definitely hold C.H. Uh, Mason Seminary in the highest regard because it is a accredited institution. And I want to state um, about that when Reverend Bracey brought that up. Um, this is something even in the International Department of Evangelism, we've had Dean Bennett on to come and address the evangelists because there are many in our communities that will hear of um, Reverend so-and-so or Dr. so-and-so has a class in their church. And if you pay $300 in two weeks, you can get a master's degree. And within three months, you can have your doctorate degree. And unfortunately, when we had Dr. Bennett on our webcast to address um, our constituency, many people were in shock because they had um, gone and uh, got these degrees in two or three weeks. And they're like, hey, I'm Dr. So-and-so, or I have my master's. I went to seminary. And then to find out you've spent that time, you've spent your money, you've called your family and friends together to come to a graduation ceremony. And you're so proud of this accomplishment only to find out you have nothing but a piece of paper. And so I would definitely uh, warn uh, the viewing audience to get an education on education and do the background. And definitely when it comes to C.H. Mason Seminary, this is a fully accredited institution and it is a degree program that will mean something. Um, if you get some of those um, uh, so-called degrees from a, a program in someone's church and then you go to uh, the university and say, I have my doctorate, I have my PhD and I got it in uh, six months, it will not be a good reaction. And so I would admonish everyone that is viewing uh, to please make sure that you do your research and get an understanding and make sure that, uh, and then of course, when they say accreditation, accreditation from whom, you know, and that's important for people to understand. So I definitely want to make mention of that. All right. I want to turn this a different direction just a little bit. Uh, Chair Lady Kennedy, you kind of alluded to uh, one of the reasons why you attended seminary was was more professional because uh, ministry was your was your, your career. Let's just say it that way. 
So then how then do we turn the mindset of, of this newer generation towards theological education when having a theological education seemingly is not celebrated? We, we, we're more concerned with the showmanship. If you can holler, you can come preach. But, but the ones who are sitting in our congregations with theological education, they just sitting in the pews, not necessarily being used. So how do we how do we then shift the mindset back to theological education for our career preachers, if you will? If I can um, jump in, and, uh, and I appreciate that question because I think it is a very relevant one. And if I may offer, uh, I, I, I don't view ministry as a career choice. I view it as a calling, number one. Uh, what the, the grapple is, especially for African-American ministers, is when you uh, have this calling on your life right, but you're also considering lifestyle and sustainability. And so many times uh, there are persons who may pursue ministry, but they are bivocational because they have to uh, take care of their family and so on and so forth. And, and so you have that context as well at work. So if there's a young man or young lady who has this call of God, but also they're becoming an adult. And so they're having to figure out how am I going to sustain? And let's be honest, in our socioeconomic uh, context, uh, most of our churches and ministries are not able to adequately uh, have a you know, full-time pastor or take care of all of those uh, things that are relevant to that. And so sometimes you have people who are wrestling there uh, but that's why it has to be a call of God, because you have to trust God with your life and know that he would order your steps. And I mean that, that all the way. Uh, so I think that it's important that we really understand those nuances around uh, why certain persons may or may not have uh, entered into a theological educational opportunity. But I, I, I do agree with you that there has to be an appreciation or theological education, and also a receptivity of those who have availed themselves and yielded themselves to come back and be a blessing to their local ministries, because it's not always as celebrated, at least in years past, more and more now we're hearing uh, more of our people who are graduating and uh, who are uh, getting degrees. Uh, but if we can celebrate that more and also show the relevance of how that fits into the context of your average Black church, that may not be able to undergird and support a person who feels that this is their life call. And I say this and I'll stop. Uh, I was one of those ones that was a bivocational minister and, and preacher. When I graduated high school, um, I went immediately into undergrad in engineering. That was my uh, path and my uh, thought that was gonna be my life journey in terms of career. Uh, my, my ultimate goal was to open a, have my own engineering consulting firm. Uh, but at the same time, I was in ministry until the Lord began to shift. And this is, is significant because I was pouring my time and resources in becoming a trained engineer. But once God led us to understand our, our calling is, is the pastorate and leadership and ministry, uh, the same energy and financial investment into that engineering uh, choice that I made, I had to make that for uh, the pathway of being a, a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I believe that if we understand our call, then we invest in that and then we have to trust God in that process. I would, I would also say that, um, you know, uh, seminary as um, uh, uh, Chair Lady uh, Kennedy uh, stated, a seminary really does not necessarily make you a great preacher. Um, uh, I went to school and we did have um, a strong emphasis on homiletics um, at ITC. Um, but I went to school with uh, very, very astute, scholarly, intelligent individuals um, who just were not um, gifted um, in, in, in that area um, and were not strong preachers. They did not have um, strong oratorical skills which are necessary um, to uh, kind of effectively communicate. So I think that um, 
we don't want to say that um, if you have not been to seminary, that you are not a gifted preacher, uh, because we know that there are so many um, that have never gone to seminary, um, that have just been gifted um, and anointed to preach. But rather, um, seminary uh, expands your mind and gives you um, tools, I believe, um, to uh, further um, investigate um, scriptures and to um, shore up uh, the uh, message and to be able to convey um, in diverse manners and to diverse crowds and audiences what it is that you believe. It is, as I stated before, it is not to assimilate to another person's thought, but it gives you the tools to really develop um, concretely your own theology so that you are able to communicate what it is um, on a uh, scholarly level that you really believe. And so I would encourage individuals who want to um, have uh, tools to do more than what we have already been doing. Um, to meet potential that may be locked within you that you did not know that you had, um, to be able to see from vantage points that you've never seen uh, from before, and to um, uh, expand your capacity and not be limited um, to what you have always been able to do because of tradition or because of your exposure, which is limited to your context, but to be able to find other ways to do the work and to do ministry. And as uh, uh, Vandalin, um, if I can, uh, Evangelist Vandalin, um, Dr. Vandalin, I'm sorry, has, has already stated, you know, that that, that preaching part, that is, um, that's a, a portion and seemingly when you go into ministry, especially full time, um, that is a, 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 a smaller portion of, of what we do. Those of us who pastor, um, whether we pastor um, in congregational settings or in institutional settings or communal settings, that is a portion of it. But what seminary does for those who are already in um, ministry, it equips us and it expands us to be able to see other ways to be able to do ministry and to have the integrity of what we do. And I'll say this lastly, um, that uh, when I was um, in um, homiletics, um, I was, uh, one of my professors uh, was Dr. Carolyn Knight. Um, uh, another professor was Dr. Hartsfield, um, celebrated uh, homileticians. And um, I was in class and I, I had come, you know, at Church of God in Christ. And so we knew how to, uh, you know, lift the service. And uh, so I had, I had gone and I was just uh, going on. I think I had my 10 minutes to preach uh, in class and I was ready. Um, and so um, my professor uh, told me, um, excellent, excellent inspiration, excellent um, uh, delivery, excellent. Uh, you know, you just, you just got it, brother. You got it. And I was like, well, praise the Lord. Uh, but he said, but you, you need to go a little deeper. Uh, and, and, and so you have that, uh, but uh, there, there needs to be some more substance to this because what you did was you just went based upon what you knew to do. Um, and, 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 and we know how to do that, but the integrity of your um, call and your ministry says that I'm not going to just lean on my ability to um, stimulate and to um, uh, enthuse uh, the people that I'm ministering to, but let me dig deeper so that I can leave something with them that is going to be concrete and going to help them to firm up uh, what it is that their own theology is as well. Piggybacking, um, we want to be better and we want to help the people that we're serving uh, to be better, right? Um, as uh, 
I'm saying President Dillard, so many titles. Bishop Dillard um, has uh, has already spoken to, you know, in this life's work. I think that's something that we can uh, give to the younger generation in this life's work. He said it's not a career, it's a calling. Um, like you, uh, Bishop, I had an 18 year career as a public school uh a teacher, administrator, and so, but this was a big part of my life, and I wanted to be able to have scholarly credibility be better. But I, I want to say this: that I think it's incumbent also upon us uh, to help others understand, not just when our names are called. Well, let me speak to myself, not just when my name is called for, oh, she's seminary, because a lot of people don't even know. They're like, oh, you know, she's just hoops and hollers. And some people may know, oh, she went to seminary. But this generation I'm finding out needs to know the why. They're not just going to go uh, to seminary because we're sounding good and they heard that uh, Vandalin went to seminary or Bishop Dillard or, you know, so the context, I'm thinking of ways in which we as leaders can have some kind of introductory sessions, uh, thought provoking opportunities that they would then say, oh, wow, that's different. We don't do that in my church. We don't do that in Sunday school. It could be something as simple as you know, the, the life and ministry of Jesus in a social justice context, right? Um, how, how ministry matters, how the community matters, bringing, to, bringing uh, subjects and opportunities for them to see beyond what we've already been doing that may not be them registering in seminary yet, but are the building blocks and the steps to opening and broadening their mind, minds and having conversations and opportunities that would have them to say, well, where did you learn that from? Okay, well, here's a book. Well, how do you, what do you know about James Cone? What do you know about, you know, whoever, Carolyn Knight or whoever? I think that is one way to bring this generation in to understand the need for more, for us to uh, have certain elementary, if you will, or introductory opportunities um, to more uh, that are not necessarily within our context. I wanna thank each of you for uh, your ability to transparently address the matter at hand. Uh, but I wanna take a, a little bit of what our brother Micah Young said about the professor who told him, go deeper. So as we sit here today, we know that you all are all uh, leaders within our denomination. And we're having this discussion about seminary as though it is some option. Yet we are all seminary trained ourselves. Uh, and if we were to change paradigm, we know that we would probably not go to a medical doctor that did not have the appropriate qualifications. As we move forward into uh, leadership and general assemblies and voting and all of those types of things, what are you all's recommendations for our church regarding seminary being a requirement versus a suggestion? Well, I was, I was going to just jump in. I thought Dr. Young was going to uh, respond to that. I think that that is a very viable um, and relevant question. Uh, as I'm sure many persons know, the other denominations do require some level of theological uh, training and education be it seminary or biblical uh, Bible college. Uh, for the Church of God in Christ, as I understand it, there's been uh, some attempts to uh, standardize, I use that term, the ordination process, uh, which I, I actually include some level of theological and biblical uh, study that is consistent across the board uh, throughout all of the jurisdictions. So I do understand that that is in the works uh, however, when we talk about the requirement of seminary uh, education, I am certainly a proponent for uh, education, training, and preparedness. Uh, what that level is, uh, it may be fluid, uh, but I'm not sure if it's altogether just a seminary master's level or doctorate level degree, but at least some type of theological uh, training and education, I think is very, very vital and important uh, for the uh, licentuants who would uh, hold the credentials of the Church of God in Christ. And if I could piggyback on what Bishop uh, Dillard has uh, shared, as he mentioned, some type of training. Um, I'm not certain, Reverend Davis, if you could say 
at this juncture a required seminary degree because in order to do that, uh, you would have to change the culture. And of course, changing culture is like taking an ocean liner. You have to slowly um, turn it. If you turn it too fast, you'll turn it over because my mind goes, and I'm sure everyone is familiar with the story of the founder of Bishop uh, C.H. Mason attending Bible college. And at that time, as uh, Evangelist Kennedy has mentioned, there was a move towards the more liberal interpretation of scripture. And of course, that grieved him. And he mentioned that God shared with him that if he would leave the school and believe the God of the Bible, that God would make a man out of him, a man of God out of him, and of course, give him a mouth uh, that no one would be able to refute. And of course, I've heard that story firsthand from his uh, late daughter that used to do a seminar at the uh, Chisco Hotel years ago. And so hearing that, um, at that time, many of the preachers and ministers would say, well, the cemetery or the seminary is the preacher's cemetery. And that was kind of the uh, buzzword that was going around at that particular time. So to change the culture to say a required um, seminary degree or required seminary training, we would have to ease that in uh, so that the saints can uh, receive it. Because I remember even when I was um, going off to university, I was told all you need is the anointing. You don't need those papers. You don't need that degree. Um, it's the anointing that destroys the yoke. And um, uh, I wanted to make mention of um, Superintendent Young when he was talking um, in regard to that. Uh, being seminary trained uh, doesn't mean a lack of the anointing, you know, and it doesn't mean that you don't have the um, ability in the pulpit. Of course, the presentation of the gospel and uh, seminary training and study of scripture is uh, two different things. And so when I look at Superintendent Young and many of you that are on here today, these are examples of individuals that are trained, but they know how to, uh, for lack of a better term, throw down when they get in the pulpit. And so uh, those two uh, can be married together, your anointing, your presentation, and of course your theological um, training. And so I think the more that people see that, uh, there will be more of an appeal for seminary training. So I believe that the best way to approach it is again, to make that um, appeal. I'm, I'm very troubled by a lot of what I see um, among many of our young ministers uh, coming up. Um, I listen at many things and they, they, they sound good, they sound great, but you can listen to a person and hear, okay, you haven't studied. You've just heard uh, different things that other people have preached and you know how to put it together in such a way. And you know, we're an emotional people. Uh, you can say your ABCs in a certain kind of way and hit the organ and we'll start rejoicing because we are an emotional people. And there's a certain way that you can um, articulate that reaches our emotion. And I'm seeing a trend in that, especially among a lot of our younger ministers. And what I've tried to do again with changing the culture, well, Hankerson, how do you change the culture? Well, you have a, a, a brother Bishop on here, Bishop Dillard and uh, myself uh, that oversee jurisdictions. And one of the things that I try to do is stress to the preachers, okay, you, you're, you're gifted, you are anointed, God is using you, but you can help the people better if you better yourself, if you get an education. It's wonderful that you have uh, preaching engagements and you can lay them out on the floor, but um, you have to look at things long term. And to take the people to a higher level long term, you have to be that example. And so in getting your education, it does something for your family. It does something for the church. And then it sets things at a total uh, separate or different level. And so I believe that changing that culture um, really starts with how you're doing right now, reaching out to pastors and leaders and bishops. And um, we have a motto at our local church, changing the world one life at a time. So change the culture, one pastor at a time, one bishop at a time, one influencer at a time. And there's great influencers that are here. And I think um, as you bring us together and uh, talk up the seminary, talk up education, 
And then, of course, all of us in our particular sphere of influence uh, can share that. And then the constituency sees it. And um, then, of course, uh, you'll see more of a change. But we must uh, change that mentality because I want to say I mentioned Bishop Mason. He was not anti-education. He sent his children uh, to university. He was a studious man himself. Um, however, it was just the liberal theology that had grieved him, but he was not against um, education and he was not against preachers uh, receiving their education as well. Um, to your point, um, Chaplain Davis, um, I think the previous question was, how do we shift the mindset back to theological education? And, and to piggyback off what both Bishop Bishop Dillard and Bishop Hankerson has said one of the one of the ways to do that um, is um, to have consistency with the standards of ministry. Um, we can certainly shift uh, the mindset back if we have a standard of ministry across the board as it relates um, to the ordination process, um, as well as the licensing process across the entire denomination. I think something you also mentioned in your question was general assembly. Um, and then, of course, we all are fully aware of how general assembly works in the Church of God in Christ. If we expand access to general assembly to other groups um, in Church of God in Christ, that would help us to demonstrate equity and representation, um, working to ensure that the future of general assembly is more just um, and more inclusive of those who have professionally prepared themselves for ministry. Um, um, as well as women, um, and are also empowered by the Holy Spirit. And so that, uh, in regards to that, uh, the leadership of the church then um, more closely reflects the body of the church. Um, so I think um, those are wonderful ideas. Um, I would, again, agree uh, with what has already been stated that um, we should, uh, you asked us what our recommendation would be. My recommendation would be that we start with conversation. I think conversation, this is not something um, that we can continue to not discuss or something that we can, you know, kind of just sweep under the carpet. But I think it is something that we need to um, have conversations about because the other thing is, is we need to streamline access to opportunities for those who are trained. Those who graduate from the seminary should have pulpits to be able to go into and I mean, all of that is process. Uh, what Bishop Hankers has said, yes, it does change the culture, but it is a step in the right direction. Well, I think Evangelist Bracey, you uh, kind of addressed my next question because uh, one of the things that I, I begin to ask is, is if a person does um, take the time to become trained uh, professionally, I, I'll go back to that word, um, the, what then becomes the reward for them? I mean, uh, one of the things that Dr. Bennett and I kind of talk about sometimes is uh, if, a, if a young man or a young woman comes out of seminary, what then does the church say to them? Okay, here, other Reformation would say, you, you finished seminary, now you can be ordained, you can pastor churches, you can serve in leadership. But I think we, we've become so heavy on the, um, the charisma or the style that, that the educational piece just kind of gets pushed off. So I'm not going to keep messing with that stuff. Chris, uh, Evangelist Tracy, you have, uh, you brought it up and I'll just leave it at that. So, <laughs> uh, mm, I'm trying another to... discussion, another day. <laughs> right. Cause you know, my wheels get to turn in and elephants start coming right. in the room and we'll leave that alone. So then last question, what then becomes the benefit outside of church for a person who is seminary trained? For me, uh, I have um, worked immediately uh, upon receiving uh, my Master's of Divinity um, in, in the institutional um, uh, context. I became a hospital chaplain um, uh, for some time. Um, and uh, I later uh, began to work in uh, the Department of Corrections uh, where um, in both of those roles, it was necessary to um, have had the uh, master's uh, level in uh, divinity or theological training. And um, I was equipped, and I think this is kind of uh, what I was speaking of earlier, um, to do ministry in a context that was outside of uh, the church. Um, it was not, um, those were not preaching roles, although there was some preaching that was a part of it, 
um, but uh, institutional ministry. I served um, uh, thousands of incarcerated men for a number of years. And I served people and their families who were dealing with health crises and, um, and even uh, life transition. Um, seminary education prepared me, equipped me, um, and made me employable um, in those areas. I think um, when it comes to opportunities outside of ministry, um, seminary education, um, college education as a whole, um, it gives you more options where you do not feel that you have to stay in your pulpit until you really can't function um, any longer. And knowing that um, you have those options, you have a whole different mentality. And that's why I'm excited when I see uh, seminary trained individuals like yourselves um, on the line like this, because again, talking about changing the culture that helps to change the culture. We all know of individuals that um, this is all that they have is the pulpit. And uh, they stay in that particular office, uh, not able to function. Um, the ministry suffers as a result, but with a seminary education, you have options outside. And so um, even though I'm a young man and uh, most everyone knows that I'm a widower now, but uh, when I first got married, the wife and I uh, set up for retirement. And that was years ago. And so I'm not retiring now, but in the future, uh, there's the plan. And uh, here are the steps that are being taken. And here's the options. And here's um, how ministry can continue even beyond the pulpit, even beyond the bishopric. Um, because again, we were all brought up in the context, be thou faithful unto death. And that means if you're on your hospital bed, um, you're still the pastor. You're still uh, the one that is in charge, but it's liberating. I've heard that term mentioned many times on the Zoom today. It's liberating knowing that you have different options. Um, hey, if um, like we just went through something very traumatic the last uh, year, the pandemic, we've never heard of a church shutting down. But even when the church um, had to shut down for those uh, certain number of months, you know, having education, there were other options. Okay, if this shuts down, we have this, we have that, we have other ways and means that we can provide for our family and continue in ministry and uh, fulfill our career. So I think if people notice that uh, with education, there comes more options, it will be more of an appeal. And especially for everyone that's watching, I, again, I wanna make the appeal that CH Mason Seminary definitely mm -hmm. Uh, is the place, and I highly recommend, highly endorse, and uh, Dr. Bennett has some tremendous um, programs that he talked about when he addressed evangelism, where even if you don't have the means, you don't have the financial resources, uh, there's still opportunities available, so I would recommend this for anyone that is uh, viewing right now. I would like to um, add to uh, Bishop Hankerson and uh, Dr. Young's um, pointers that they gave uh, with the many options. Uh, and I think that talks about you being diversified and what you, uh, how you're able to present yourself and convey what your calling is. Um, and I, I, I thought about something that Paul says, and it may not be specific to this context, but he said, let us walk worthy of the vocation wherewith we've been called. Uh, because we've been called, walking worthy of that, yes, speaks of uh, practicality, but also preparedness of being able to represent uh, the one who called us as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ outside of the context of our local church, or even in this situation, Church of God in Christ. I have uh, been afforded opportunities uh, to, to share in other universities and seminaries, and let's be honest, there, there are some that see you on those platforms, they would immediately tune and turn you out if they are not clear on what your credibility is. So it brings uh, credibility. I remember an undergrad uh, had to take an elective, of course, this is for my engineering program. And so I was going to take piano, piano class 101, uh, because I was a church musician. And so I played by ear. I uh, didn't know how to read music. I just about playing every key. And uh, so I thought I was going to impress the professor. And I went in just as uh, Brother Makai said, it went in preaching 
uh, inspirationally and all of that. I went in playing the man. I thought I was doing that. And when I stopped, he's, he's told me I was, he was not impressed at all because I was not skilled. I had a good sound. I could play by ear, but was not skilled and trained. And so I think that outside of the immediate context of our worship services, uh, if we're going to have the respect and credibility that we do need that training and, and those levels of education are so important as we come outside of the four walls of our church. And if we're going to make impact in circles and be at tables, we're talking about social justice and we're talking about all of the ills of society in order to speak to that outside of the pulpit. Sometimes you need that backing outside of just your influence or inspiration. And I was going to say that if ministry is about service, there are so many ways that we can serve and we do serve beyond the pulpit and beyond the four walls. I know people that have gone to ministry that are not in pulpit or church ministry. Um, they're running nonprofits. Uh, they're doing social justice work. They're activists. Uh, they're uh, just serving the community in, with resources. I didn't have an understanding before I went to seminary. I was like, well, why are you here? But now I totally understand um, that they're using their faith as a foundation and a basis uh, to serve others in other ways. And so if we're going to be outside of the, in the community, which again, this generation coming now, they have no interest in just being in the four walls. They want to know why does this matter? Why is this important? And so there are young people that will go to seminary who will not necessarily preach in a pulpit. Uh, and that is okay. But that seminary training and understanding and having that theological foundation will still set you up to be uh, able to be effective in the ministry, whatever that is, whatever the service area is that you are in. I couldn't agree more with you, uh, Chair Lady Kennedy. I think that um, one of the main benefits outside of the church um, of attending seminary is the emphasis on um, social justice ministry. Um, obviously, seminary allows us to go deeper in our spirituality, even if you are not necessarily a preacher or a pastor. But another major difference is that seminary focuses on leadership. And so you are trained to be a leader even outside even outside of the four walls of the church. But back to social justice, um, the Church of God in Christ was a huge part of the civil rights movement. And I don't know if a whole lot of people know the history of that. Um, the fact that one of our former presiding bishops, Bishop uh, Ford, eulogized Emmett Till, and um, his death was really the catalyst for the civil rights movement. I think about the fact that uh, Malcolm X, his funeral was held at Faith Temple Church of God in Christ in Harlem. And, you know, Dr. King um, preached his very last speech. I've been to the mountaintop that was delivered at Mason Temple. So seminary, um, those um, Afro centric theological perspectives that we get in seminary, the voices and witnesses that we glean from, how we're reading books that are authored by people of color and those resources that we use. I think that the training in womanist, theolo um, womanist theology, and I think Superintendent Young talked earlier about liberation theology, critical race theory, all of those things gives us the tools to do further justice work in other um, spaces and in other industries. And that's a calling because God is a God of justice. And so therefore we also should be concerned um, about justice as well in and outside of the church. Can I Can speak I... back in here? Oh, sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. I just want to speak back in with a story. You just made me think of something. I was, when I was at Union, I was able to study with Dr. Cornell West. And so we were studying the civil rights movement. His, his, he was doing a class on Martin, Martin and Malcolm. And in that we had to meet with, with our professor and I wanted to do something about the Pentecostal church and what our role should be. And so I said, do you know of, uh, you know, any scholars or, you know, where can I go? Who can I talk to? And he's said, uh, you know how he talks, uh, Vandalin, you, you church of God in Christ, right? I said, yes, sir. Yes. He said, Bishop Charles Blake during the civil rights movement, he was the head of the, it's the SNCC and he is one of the main, it blew my mind because I had no idea. And so this 
is very important and why we need uh, training and why we need to, um, you know, extend. It extends beyond the four walls of the church. So absolutely. You just made me think of that story. And can I sneak one more in to that <laughs> while we're there? Because this is very, very important. Uh, Bishop G. Patterson, uh, the, the sanitation strike that led to Dr. King coming to Memphis, he was heavily, heavily involved in the organization of that group with the I'm a man and working with the local union here uh, was uh, very much on point. It was not just a photo op when you see him around, but he was actually in the throes of organization of that that led to a lot of what was happening here on ground in Memphis and ultimately Dr. King coming here. Evangelist Harris, did you still have something? It, it, you know, all the information that, that's coming across is just so juicy and good that, you know, I was kind of just sitting back and listening and absorbing. But, you know, when you come to the realization that the four walls, it, within the four walls, we're just basically preaching to each other. And that, you know, the, the, the community and outside of those four walls are in such a great need of our knowledge, of our, uh, our, our public theology. It's not necessary that we have to say, you know, you have to uh, go a certain way in a religious step, but there's spirituality out there that we have to deal with. Me, um, personally, I have a, a nonprofit women's center that deals with women coming out of prison. And as I do, um, looking at my, my, my proposal and my dissertation that, that I'm doing now, I'm looking at the, the spiritual and mental uh, uh, brokenness within these women because of the trauma that they've received before prison. Why are you in prison? You're in this heinous condition and then coming out and dealing with a community that have made you a subculture because you're now a felon is, is just, you know, a, a lot for a person to take. So with us as, as um, uh, uh, seminarians, we, we cut, we, we, we've got the tools to, to help the brokenness within our communities. We become advocates. We become voices for these people, which is the same thing that Dr. King did and all the rest of them you know, have done. They stepped up and become advocates for those that, that do not have voices. And with these women, what I'm doing through seven, and I'm so excited about my education. Oh my God, it, it radiates, you know, it's just like when you say, when I see you, I see Jesus. Oh boy, you know, when you see me, you see the education that they're, 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 they're uh, pouring into me and, and the understanding because I, I see the growth in me. I know others do because it's got to radiate what's on the inside shows on the outside, you know? So all that I'm getting, I am so anxious to share, but my foundation is my family. I start there first. And then, you know, my grand, my kids, my grandchildren, and then spread it out because, you know, the best way to get the information out is to tell somebody and they tell somebody and they tell somebody. You know, so as far as working within the community or taking it outside of the four walls, being in the seminary, and, and let me tell you this, and, and I want to go back just, just one second. I had a professor, he went around the room and asked everybody what denomination they, they were. And I said, I was Church of God in Christ. And that man, and I'm going to say it that way, told me, oh, you all are not real. I was through back and I was, I was, I was hurt by him saying that and then said in front of the class. So when we talk about the respect, you know, we carry ourselves in a dignified way. We carry ourselves as representative of our calling. And for someone to belittle my beliefs like that. And that's why I feel we can't do that with, you know, we have to deal with the spiritual portion, the spiritual healing, the spiritual growth of, of individuals rather than 
you know, saying that you've got to do it this way because this is the way that I do it, um, which is very important. But we, we've got to be an advocate for the community. We've got to stand up and be the voice that, that has been silent. Listen, we're getting ready to uh, wrap up today's um conversation but before we go offline i know that we're celebrating founders week of the, the seminary i want to do something really quickly i want to kind of round robin this and allow each of these leaders of our great church to encourage our current seminarians and even those who may be straddling the fence of going to seminary at all so we can start with bishop hankerson and just kind of go around the panel and we'll come back and end it yes god bless you thank you again so much for this great opportunity and on behalf of the International Department of Evangelism of the Church of God in Christ, we would like to encourage every seminarian to continue honing your skills so that you can skillfully proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ across the country and around the world. And I would like to personally appeal to every evangelist, um, those that feel the calling to hit the field, and to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, I would encourage you to consider uh, seminary education. And you've heard the benefits of seminary education today from these tremendous scholars. And I do ask that you would please consider the C.H. Mason Theological Seminary. It is doctrinally sound because it is the school and the institution of our great church. And so we ask that you would pray and that you would consider, and please do not let finances prohibit you because there are resources available. So contact the seminary today and sign up to become the next seminarian at C.H. Mason Theological Seminary. And don't forget, every time you turn around, God is blessing you. God bless. Bishop Taylor. Thank you. Um, you know, as we were sharing today, there were many thoughts that were racing through my mind. And I thought about the uh, the text in Esther said, who knows thou has come into the kingdom for a time such as this. And those who are already engaged in seminary and those who are considering, uh, there's never, there will never be another acceptable time as now, given the need for your life and your ministry in this world. But one of the major takeaways from this conversation today is that seminary is not just about preparing to preach or even preparing to pastor or looking for a pulpit. God is broad, he's bigger than we can ever imagine and the needs of our world and our society is huger than a pulpit and a microphone. And so seminary is an opportunity to prepare you, develop you, grow you, expand you and uh, place you in a trajectory to make an impact uh, through the calling that God has on your life. You may not end up being a Bishop Hankerson or, or chair lady or president, but who has God called for you to be? Understand your why, because your why will determine your what. And so as you are matriculating through seminary or preparing to go or trying to make that decision, understand that it's about your call and not try to fit a mold of someone else. God uniquely created you and prepared you for this moment. I'm excited about what has been shared today and thankful for the opportunity to share with so many great personalities. Thank you to Dr. Bennett, Brother Pierce, and also Dr. Davis. This has been a phenomenal discussion and I trust and pray that uh, as we continue, those who are watching, uh, who needs to consider seminary, C.H. Mason Theological Seminary is I believe a uh, place that you can grow, live, learn, and develop and prepare yourself to walk worthy of the calling wherewith God has called you. And I'll stop since uh, Bishop Hankerson snuck a little preach in. God is up to something and you're right in the middle of it. Something good is getting ready to happen to you right now and in your future. God bless you. I wish I had known uh, and, and was able to travel and could have gone to C.H. Uh, Mason Seminary uh, at the time that I did. Now that I know what seminary is, I know it would have been a phenomenally rich experience. So I definitely encourage you uh, to think about that. I want to encourage the uh, those that are in seminary now. I know it's rough, but you are right in the middle of formation 
everything, you may not see it now, but everything that you are experiencing and learning is not so as uh, Pastor Young said, so that you can clone or, or assimilate, but so that you can come out uh, the, the better person. Um, I'm reminded when I was in seminary, I told you I went to a liberal seminary and I remember us discuss, discussing the second coming of Jesus Christ. And it was discussed from an academic perspective, but me as a conservative, I was literally made fun of. The, the professor actually said, um, well, we know, you know, that's not really true. Like that's not, you know, there are people that really believe that. And I was like, yeah, I'm one of them. Um, you will be challenged. You will, you may leave at times and uh, say, what in the world am I doing? But it's all making you better. It's making you stronger. Being in those situations helped me to be able to defend my faith and to be able to understand even more foundationally what I believe. And I can minister out of that foundation. Uh, to those that are considering it, again, it is a worthy, worthy calling. And I'm reminding, reminded of the scripture in Isaiah that says, God will make us new, sharp, and threshing instruments. I don't just want to be an instrument. I don't want to be dull, but I want to get everything that I possibly can so that I can be sharp and so that I can thresh the mountains and do what it is that God has called me to do. God bless you. And I thank you for this opportunity. And I'm so thankful for these brilliant minds on here. I did not know that Bishop Hankerson went to, uh, was theologically trained. I did not know about my sister, Reverend uh, da Miller Davis and so I'm so happy that you all uh, have brought us together. And I hope that as you listen, that you will understand that seminary is something that would be great uh, for your life and your future. Let me um, just uh, once again, thank you for uh, the privilege of being a part of this panel uh, with such brilliant minds in our church. Um, I would like to just encourage those of you who are in seminary right now, especially those of you who are Church of God in Christ, and uh, you're concerned about um, where you will be placed after graduation, um, let me say to you that um, though it is not a requirement um, to serve in this church, um, to have um, seminary training, um, there is a respect that the church has for theological training and it is a growing respect. Um, there is room for all of us to serve in this church, but I would like to suggest that um, you realize that um, the world is calling for you and that the tools that you will be given uh, in seminary will equip you to not just uh, serve uh, within the confines of our denomination, but will prepare you to be able to serve beyond our denomination and to work in the trenches, in the communities, to work in institutions, to work in government. Um, there is no limit or boundaries um, to what opportunities will be available to you. So do not allow yourself to feel discouraged or to feel like the church does not uh, value you or appreciate you. Um, it's not our current structure. And um, therefore, um, it may not be viewed in the same way as some of your um, fellow uh, seminarians who will leave seminary uh, after having uh, attended as a requirement for their uh, denomination and go into pulpits and congregations um, uh, because of their denominational structure. But just know that God has prepared your path, your course is set, your future is bright, and there is a place that is developed just for you uh, in the earth. God is going to use you to make great impact. And as long as you are effective, effectively using what God has given to you, God will bless you and he'll open doors that can't be closed by anyone. And he will prepare the table for you wherever you go. So be blessed, my brothers and my sisters. I think that I perhaps uh, am of the ones that I know of evangelist uh, Wright Harris is in seminary and 
Reverend uh, Davis is representing the seminary also, but I'm one of the older uh, graduates uh, from ITC, C.H. Uh, Mason Theological Seminary, and it is a blessing. The Church of God in Christ has been a blessing to my entire life, and they helped me during seminary. They gave me opportunities uh, the entire time I was in seminary and after graduation. Stay with God and stay with the church. Amen. It has been um, a privilege to be on this panel with each of you. Thank you again to C.H. Mason Seminary um, and to Dean Bennett um, for this wonderful opportunity. Um, to current seminarians and those who are considering seminary, um, I'll quote the scripture, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, uh, 2 Timothy 2 and 15. Um, I'll leave you with these words. Seminary, it's a journey. Um, it is not a destination. Um, the learning is forever ongoing through the entire process. Once you finish a uh, seminary, it is ongoing. And just remember that it is one thing to study God, but it is another thing to know God. And so use this opportunity to deepen, you know, your relationship with God as you are sharpening those tools for ministry. Um, and so coming from my own life context as a seminarian, as a proud fourth generation member of the Church of God in Christ, um, who has served at um, all the levels in this church, I really congratulate you on this next step um, and carefully discerning the voice of the Lord um, and also having the opportunity to serve in every aspect of the life of the church. Um, and so let me say we affirm your ministry gifts, um, especially to the women who are in seminary. Um, we affirm you in this space. Um, one of my preaching professors, the Reverend Dr. William Clare, Turner Jr., he once said, uh, a Christianity that does not produce a quarrel with the world is utterly suspect. And so, in other words, we um, seminarians, we have not been called in order to maintain the status quo or to keep people comfortable, but we have been called to preach the saving power of Jesus Christ. Remember that as you matriculate in seminary, it is God's appointed means to proclaim redemption for the world. And it has pleased God through the foolishness of preaching to save those who believe. So remember that we are preaching until Christ is present among the people. And this witnesses to the work of the Father and to the completion of all things through the Son. Please feel free to reach out to me. I'm sure the others uh, would agree with the same. If you have any questions about your journey, questions, uh, practical questions, spiritual questions, anything you need as far as taking this next step, I avail myself to you for that. So thank you for this time and God bless you all. I also want to give thanks and amen everyone that has spoken. I want to give thanks for this opportunity to be on this panel on today because I, I, I consider myself a, a little one um, to all the big hitters that's on here on today. Uh, but I'm loving, I'm loving my journey. Uh, and I do want to compel and, 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 and I do want to let you know that when I chose to come to C.H. Mason, that was one of the best decisions that I have made. Um, in my ministry, in my, in my journey. I have experienced so much. I have been awake, awakened um, in, 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 in areas that, you know, when you don't know, you don't know. But when you do know, you do better. So if you're looking for a deeper depth into your experience, into your vocation, into your calling, look to the seminary. Look to C.H. Mason, especially if you're looking for an Afrocentric flavor to it, just to understand who you are and to understand your people. You know, I think about Christ when he was here. He took his 12 disciples through the seminary of Jesus, I guess I would say, three years. They walked with him and he taught them for three years before he let them loose before he allowed them to go and to carry on that ministry. So you think about it when, when it comes time to, you know that you're stepping into leadership, knowledge is such a great thing. And to have that knowledge gives you the confidence to, to speak your words um, with force, your truth to power. 
So these are the things that we look at when we when we're looking at um, going into the seminary. Best choice that I've made, you know. So if you are looking to do that, or you are, and right now my journey is great. Um, come on, join me here at C.H. Mason Seminary. Thank you, Reverend Davis. Well, what a delight to co-host with you, Superintendent Pierce. You know, there was a time that there was the concern that we would lose our burning if we got our learning. But we see now today that there are such great leaders of our church, those that we have heard from today so profoundly. And I think that the scripture that comes to mind for me is Isaiah 65. Forget not the former things. Don't get stuck in those things of old. For behold, God is doing a new thing. So I would say to all of our seminarians, to those who are even in our church considering seminary, just look before you. See these wonderful leaders who are seminary trained and not just seminary trained, but anointed of God. They got some of the baddest preachers in Kojic who are on this panel on today. We have our general supervisor of women, Mother McCool Lewis, who herself is theologically trained with a master's of arts and theological studies from Fuller Theological Seminary. If we look all around our church, we see that our leaders are not just those who are Holy Ghost filled, hand clapping, tongue talking members of our Church of God in Christ, but they are also well educated. And I would say to all of our women in ministry, just continue to allow the gift that God has given you to make room for you. I have had the honor to serve as an ordained member of the Church of God in Christ, ordained by the Bishop O.T. Jones Jr., the son of Bishop O.T. Jones Sr., who was the one who himself did the research and called for the commission for there to be a C.H. Mason Theological Seminary. I am not a graduate of C.H. Mason Seminary, but I'm a graduate of Oral Roberts University, where the first president dean of C.H. Mason, our Dr. Leonard Lovett, was my professor in seminary. So there are all kinds of opportunities for us to hold to the faith and the doctrine of our church, as well as to be those who are reminded that the spirit of God yet fills us to make a difference, as Bishop Mason would say, in the everywhere. So encouragement to our seminarians, thank you to our leaders and our panel, and also to our bishops and our friends of C.H. Mason, like you and myself, who are listening. This is a time to make it possible for that person that is sitting in your congregation who wants to go further in the things of God to be able to have this seminary education. C.H. Mason Seminary has been around since 1970. So I would plead with our jurisdictional leaders, with our bishops, with those who are able to give to our seminary, to take this opportunity to give to our seminary, to support those in your jurisdiction who would like to go forward with their education, because this is the time and this is the day that we can make a difference in this world if we are prepared to follow the path that God has set before us. Wow, what a phenomenal opportunity we have had. Um, to each of our panelists, I say thank you for once again your time and for your information that you've shared with uh, current seminarians and those who will come later on down the road. To our illustrious Dean, the Dean Harold Bennett, thank you so much, sir, for this opportunity to share uh, just a, a bit of space during this Founders Week. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm full right now. Um, and so, uh, listen, I want to encourage you. Dean Bennett's going to come back uh, just after we are done and give, uh, give us the various ways that we can give to support the work of the C.H. Mason Theological Seminary. But I want to, I want to beg of you, if, you, if I can use that language, to support your seminary. We are all children of the week. We are all Mason's children. And this is a school for us, by us. And we need your support. And so today, as we get ready to go off the air, once again, I want to say thank you to each of our panelists. Thank you for the opportunity, Dean Bennett, to lead this discussion. And uh, we look forward to seeing you very soon. Be blessed. God bless you. And I think the world of the goodness of the Lord. I think the world of the Charles Harrison Mason Theological Seminary, where they're educating men and women for ministry in the Church of God in Christ in the world. In fact, Mason's graduates, Charles Harrison Mason Theological Seminary, our graduates are serving all over the world. In fact, from the grounds of the Charles Harrison Mason Theological Seminary have come general board members, have come pastors, 
missionaries, evangelists, college professors, military officers, chaplains, just we are everywhere and we're there because you care. And I thank the Lord for you and your gifts. I invite you to join me in this ministry of giving. Would you join me as we plant a seed in the education ministry of the Church of God in Christ in the Charles Harrison Mason Theological Seminary? I have my device here and I, let, let's do this together. Let's do this together. I'd like for you to join me. Please consider sharing a gift of $50, $50 uh, with the Charles Harrison Mason Theological Seminary. $50 will help purchase a book. $50 will help us defray the cost of tuition. $50 will help us help young men and women, you know, get the quality education that they need to make a difference. In the world, join me, $50, $50. Would you, I have my device. Let's do this together. Let's do this as a team. Let's do this as a team. There, there are multiple ways that you can give. You have your device. You can give uh, via Givelify, $50 through Givelify. And what you want to do is search for Charles H. Mason Theological Seminary. Got it? Yeah. Charles H. Mason Theological Seminary. You can give using uh, Venmo or Zelle. And what you want to do is use our phone number or the email address. And our phone number is 404-507-4853. That's the phone number for the Charles Harrison Mason Theological Seminary. And the email is C Mason Seminary. 1970 at Gmail. You can use your Zelle or your Venmo. You can use Givelify. You can give via snail mail. You can write out a check. You would make the check payable to the Charles Harrison Mason Theological Seminary. And you would mail the check to the Charles Harrison Mason Theological Seminary, 700 Martin Luther King Jr. Drive, Southwest, Atlanta, Georgia, 30314. That's Charles Harrison Mason Theological Seminary, 700 Martin Luther King Jr. Drive, Southwest, Atlanta, Georgia, 30314. And you'd make the check payable to the Charles Harrison Mason Theological Seminary. Come on, I have my phone. Let's give right now. Let's give. Let's go on and give. Let's give $50. Let's go on and do the $50. Thank you so much for your giving. All right. I'm going to pray for you. Father, in the name of Jesus, God, thank you for everything. Thank you for your givers. God, thank you for the well-wishers. Thank you for those who are praying for the school. Lord, we pray that this hour, God, that you will bless the givers. Bless those who are praying for us. God, and we pray in the blessed name of Jesus that you will continue to bless the Charles Harrison Mason Theological Seminary through the ministry of giving. Thank you for your people. Thank you for these gifts. Lord, you're wonderful. You are the blesser. Continue, God, to do what you do. And we pray, God, that these gifts will be used for the reasons and the purpose for educating your men and women. Lord, like you sent them. In Jesus' name, God, we will do your will. In his name we pray. Amen. I love you. Come on, give yourselves a hand. Give your hands. God bless the saints. I am Chaplain Anthony Allen, class of 06. I'm currently a staff chaplain at the Oklahoma City VA in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Receive the benediction and the closing prayer. Father God, in Jesus' name, we thank you for what we have experienced here today. We are reminded that the Holy Script teaches us to study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So as we come to the end of our time together, our prayers that you will continue to provide anointed and qualified faculty 
staff, and administrators for the C.H. Mason Seminary. We pray that our church, the Church of God in Christ, will continue to financially support abundantly above the basic needs of the seminary. We pray that our church clergy, members, and future students will recognize the spiritual and educational value of being trained at the C.H. Mason Seminary to enhance the teaching and the education ministry in the local church. We pray that the C.H. Mason Seminary will grow in spiritual passion and academic excellence, as well as attendance. We pray that our seminary will develop church leaders who will maintain biblical and doctoral purity as they prepare to lead churches, evangelize the laws, and disciple believers in an ever-changing world. Now, as we go into the everywhere, let your word manifest in our lives. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. God bless you. Good night.